I gave people all the stuff they really needed. Social security checks, utility bills, TV guide. I want a TV guidance counselor. everybody welcome it's the end of 2022 and you know what that means the tradition that i started i don't know four years ago when i didn't have a guest at the end of the year <laughs> of just me and a microphone and my calendar going through the year looking back and kind of giving you a director's commentary if you will about the episodes maybe going through some things that you missed uh talking about other things that i did outside of the show uh personally or, or appearing on other podcasts or things you might want to check out uh i tend to get a little bit more reflective this is a, a little bit more loosey-goosey <laughs> um um introspective here uh so this is our this is our end of the year episode uh i do want to say that I want to thank you guys for listening. I like, I cannot thank you enough. And also you'll hear, hear my cat. That's one thing that happened this year. Um, my 18 year old cat has become incredibly senile and just yells in the background. So it's going to happen. I'm not stopping every time she does that. Cause it would, I wouldn't talk at all. Um, but she, she seems healthy. Otherwise, um, she's still live and kicking. So that's good. Uh, if I'm alive and kicking and healthy, but just yelling at uh, an Elvis Presley uh, uh, Jim Jim Beam bottle, which is what she's doing presently, you know, I, hey, I'm I'm doing okay. Don't don't worry about me. Um, but yeah, I just want to thank you guys so much. I this year um, was slightly easier than the previous year, but that is saying uh, not that much. Um, no health scares this year, which was good. Um, had some some lows and some highs. So that was good. I hope your year was good as well. Um, you, you know, I always like to hear from you guys and I, and I thank everyone who reaches out to on social media or sends me an email, uh, or the patrons, especially thank you guys so much for, for giving me your hard earned money, uh, for doing the show. It helps me not lose money on the show, which, uh, you know, is a good thing. I'm a very bad businessman. Um, but this year I have, this will be my, 57th episode this year, which is pretty amazing, uh, and is of over 5,000 minutes of talking. That's 5,000 minutes of episodes, which um, I'm, I don't do the math there, but that's like, well, I don't know, what, 100 hours or something like that? Also, uh, if you haven't heard one of these episodes before, <laughs> I don't really edit them very much, so you may hear me taking a sip of seltzer or clearing my throat more than usual because I cut out a lot of that stuff. Um, but 2023 will be year 10 of the show, which is insane. Uh, I was thinking back when I was just sort of prepping for this about the first couple of years of the show, when I would record these intros, um, with my zoom recorder without an external mic, just a built-in mic sitting in my closet among t-shirts for, for good quality sound. And, uh, and that's pretty funny. So here I am now with a real microphone and everything in a, in a little studio in my home. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, but let's go back. Let's take a look. Uh, we're in January, 2022 now, everybody. Uh, and as you just heard, that was Josh Cater of the smoking Pope's, uh, new purpose written theme song for the show TV guidance counselor. And I am still over the moon that he did that. Uh, <clears throat> Josh is one of my all time favorite uh, just musicians and people. And he actually has a Christmas song out now when I woke up on Christmas morning, which you can get on uh band camp and it, just Google it, Josh caterer. It's, it's really great as everything he does is, but that, uh, that song he purposely intentionally wrote for the show was in an accident and it's perfect. And, uh, if you're a patron, you have a download and listen to the whole thing. Um, and it is well worth listening to, uh, Josh and I talked about putting that out as like a, a limited edition single, like a vinyl single. Um, but then we didn't do it, but I don't know, maybe we may do it again some year. Uh, but yeah, we had the new, this is our first year of the new theme song. Uh, the very first episode we did of 2022 was, this, was with Frankie Frain and Frankie is of red cow entertainment, uh, which was a, a YouTube show I discovered in a YouTube channel. Rather, I discovered in 2021, although they'd been doing it about 10 years. Uh, they did a thing called box Mac. Frankie's a local guy made a bunch of movies, still has a podcast now. Uh, and you should follow that channel on YouTube, but that was a really great chat. I enjoyed talking to him, uh, as he, you know, local guys, always good entertainment nerds, always good. Uh, and that was a nice chat. 
he also, <clears throat> man, uh, I keep losing my voice. I don't know what's going on with that. I, I've been to the doctor. There's nothing wrong and I haven't had COVID. So that's good. But, uh, that episode also, I, I do film, I guess film record every episode, the video, but it's usually just a backup for my audio. And, uh, so I have video of every episode. I don't know if people want to see that, but, um, Frankie actually edited that together. So there's on the red cow entertainment channel, there's a video of the whole episode we did. So if you want to see that, um, I'll put a link in the show description there and you can, you can see that here. Uh, I, uh, I enjoy doing it. Um, oh, I also noticed in my my calendar of putting my I was weighing myself uh, every two days because I was trying to lose some weight. Um, I did get down below two fifty, but not much below, um, which is good. But not you know I could do better. I'm I'm six foot three. Um, I tried that Noom thing. Uh, it didn't work for me. It probably works for some people, but it didn't work for me. Uh, then the next episode we did, episode 505, uh, was Hattie Hayes, who I lo- she's just the best. I love Hattie. Um, I did a virtual game show with her, um, Paul Gobel, a couple years ago, and always wanted to have her on the show. Uh, she's a New York-based comedian and writer. She's got a great uh, weekly newsletter you can sign up for now. Uh, she's just a lot of fun, uh, and that was that was a fun chat. And then uh, I had Tom Hardy on, not Tom Hardy, <clears throat> the Venom Tom Hardy, but Tommy Hardy, aka Tommy Somerville, uh, on episode 506. And Tommy is somebody I've known for like 20 plus years. Uh, he's a Boston uh, punk rock kid, and that one gets super Bostony if you like. If you like super Bostony things, that one's right up your alley. Uh, Tommy also has a YouTube show called The Uncle Boy Show. That's very fun, and you can check that out there as well. Uh, then, uh, episode 507, I had Dr. Molly Miller on, and Dr. Molly Miller is a musician. She's actually a doctor of musicology, uh, which is a thing. And I, in 2021 and 2022, I, I, I rediscovered my love of guitars. <laughs> so I learned how to fix them and, and do all kinds of stuff like that with YouTube tutorials and um, was kind of buying used ones and crappy broken ones. And I also resubscribed to guitar magazines <laughs> and uh, Molly's in a bunch of them because she's like a well-renowned uh, guitarist. And so I asked her to do the show and that was, that was a fun one. Um, it was inter- it's always interesting to chat to people who are not actors or writers or people who make TV or comedians, but are like adjacent to it. Like Molly was in the uh, house band, I think for the bachelor does a lot of movie and TV music. Uh, grew up in LA lives in LA. So that was, that was pretty exciting. Uh, then <clears throat> to end out October, October. What the hell am I talking about? January. <laughs> I always have October on my mind. I'm just like an October state of mind. Uh, maybe if I ever do another record, that'll go on the short list of titles, October state of mind, um, that I may or may not do. But, uh, I, I did a two parter, <clears throat> not intended to be a two parter, but the first episode of February, I recorded with British writer, comedian, Robin Ince. We did two episodes that came out five eighty. 508 and 509 that week, that last week of January, first week of February, it's like five hours of talking. Uh, but Robin rules. He's, he's, you know, a person after my own heart, but far, far smarter than I am. Uh, very, very popular in the UK. Uh, and again, I, as awful as the pandemic has been, um, one of the good things is that it's enabled me, or I could have done it before, but it encouraged me to uh, do episodes with people who are not in Boston or LA or New York or places I am. And that has resulted in people in Canada and in England and Ireland and all that kind of stuff that I wouldn't normally have had on the show um, or, or really thought of to have on the show. And Robin's a perfect example. Um, and, you know, although I did get a bad review of someone who complained about the audio on the show, um, who I which bothered me forever, because that's what happens when I get a bad review. Um, if you want to leave a good review, that'd be great. Uh, but uh, I think I've done a pretty good job of making most of the episodes sound like we're in the same room and uh, overcoming some of the technical stuff. Uh, if I can pat myself on the back there a little bit, because I hear other shows or even watch things on TV and they just sound and look like garbage. And I don't know, most people don't seem to care. Uh, but I spend a lot of time on every episode. Uh, I spend, I would say every hour of the show, there's about three hours of edit prep 
record time. So it's like a three to one ratio. So for every hour of the show, I've done three hours of work is probably about the average. Um, I probably could get away with not doing that, <laughs> but I still, I, you know, I want things to flow well and sound good. And so I, I do all that kind of stuff for your benefit. I do it for you. You made me do this. That's, that's what I'm saying. Uh, it is, it is something that I, uh, I don't know. I kind of proud, pride myself a little bit on having like a decent sounding show. Uh, but I don't know. People probably don't care. Maybe you don't either. What were you guys watching this year, by the way? I, I don't have those in my calendar, so I don't know when, what came out when, but some of the stuff I really enjoyed this year was number one is extraordinary attorney Wu, which is a South Korean show. It was on Netflix here in the United States. And I think probably most other countries, it is beautiful. It's, it's about a, a, a lawyer with autism, but it's smart and funny and sweet and uh, well worth watching. That, that was one of the highlights of the year for sure. Uh, I also love She-Hulk. I know a lot of people hate She-Hulk for some reason, including Frankie Frayne, our first guest of the year, uh, it, which is strange to me. Um, I, have, I, have very, I have very complicated thoughts about the MCU, everybody, as someone who's been reading comics since 1982 when I was two years old and going to conventions since 1985 when I was five and who read all of the source material <clears throat> for all of these movies. Um, I have to say some are more fun than others, but one of my big problems with um, – the MCU, and actually this was a problem I had with Marvel and DC Comics, was these these company-wide uh, editorial edicts that are the crossover events, which are not a creative endeavor. They're literally to get you to buy more comics that you wouldn't normally buy so you can get a whole story, or to see movies you wouldn't normally see so you can get a whole story. They occasionally will come up with great stuff. Crisis on Infinite Earths was really great. Um, the original Marvel Secret Wars is complete garbage. <laughs> um, although there was a toy line, and it is where Spider-Man's black costume came about, which became Venom later, uh, which incidentally, I think in 2022, I watched the second Venom movie and really liked it. Um, I, th I don't know if people like those, but I really liked it. But, you know, there have been some good good events, X-Men's Inferno, that sort of stuff, with some, some pretty cool stories as a result. But for the most part, they, they don't generally work. And even the original late 80s, early 90s Infinity War and all that kind of stuff was kind of lame, to be honest with you. Um, so it is kind of cool to see characters interact and stuff, but I hate when stuff's just pieces in a puzzle and you don't get a whole story. It's a whole thing. Um, I also don't really like Tony Stark as a character. Uh, like, I get why they built the whole MCU around him because Marvel did a whole reboot in the, uh, it was sort of a, I guess it wasn't a soft reboot. They had a secondary line of comics, um, which were like more like a, like an alternate universe of Marvel and more realistic things. And in that universe, <clears throat> they based everything around the super soldier serum from Captain America. So like every superpower or thing that went wrong was around someone trying to recreate the super soldier series. Like, so that was kind of it. And in the MCU, they kind of did a similar thing with um, Tony Stark, which kind of made sense, but um, I just, I found him irritating and I found him irritating in the comics too. He's like, if Hugh Hefner was a huge dickhead um, and also fancied himself a superhero, but regardless um I, I i don't necessarily think that shared universe stuff is an asset and so uh i like self-contained stories i like stories that exist in a universe of their own i loved the batman for example uh that didn't exist in a greater dc universe um but also wasn't an origin story and had an atmosphere and told a story and introduced characters just like normal movies do where we don't need to know their entire backstory and history they uh you know it was, it was well done i really really enjoyed that and i loved uh suicide squad which is a sequel uh and in in a universe in a shared universe but that was just just such a fun great movie uh peacemaker and I could have taken or leaving that TV show. Taken or leaving. Taken or leaving. Taken or left, I guess I would say. Is that the past tense of take or leave? Take or left that show. But the Suicide Squad movie was, was really, really fun. Anyway, I uh oh, and Moon Knight was <clears throat> that was a missed opportunity. Uh they got really bogged down and and just like psychological 
garbage, which normally is my thing, but uh, it, it got really boring. Uh, although F. Murray Abraham, always great. Uh, he was the voice of the, uh, the, the moon god in that. Uh, but anyway, She-Hulk manages to be fun on its own while also tying into the, the greater Marvel universe, cinematic universe. And there's a lot of in jokes, but I think a lot of stuff works on its own. Uh, and yes, that is the tone of the comics. The comics were fourth wall breaking. They made fun of fanboys, which is what we used to call them in my day. Um, they made fun of the sort of male gaze of, uh, and I, with a Z, not a Y they didn't do that. <clears throat> the male gaze of, uh, female superheroes and all that kind of stuff, which they do in this. And it's just updated to, uh, crap on incels and alt-right message board people who should be crept on because they're terrible people and they've made a world, uh, that I don't enjoy as much as I did before they used to do that. But, uh, she was funny and it was fun. Uh, and I, 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 I find no fault in it. <laughs> um, uh, it was, it was a very fun show. Uh, I'm trying to think of other things I may have watched this year that were new to me that were really good. Um, I think it's called anxious people. It was a Dutch show. I think, um, about a bank robbery sort of that was on Netflix and was really fun and funny and weird and sad and sweet and, and very, very good. Watched a lot of foreign stuff, uh, foreign to me at least. Um, cause I am American and speak English. Um, anyway, we're in February, 2022 still. And so the two part Robin ins, that's what we did there. Um, I also did the word of the day podcast with dead air Dennis Mahler, who is a comic who hasn't been on the show, but, um, should be on the show at some point. And he's a stand up comic I've known for years. He's an ex punk rock kid from the DC area. Um, he's done podcasts and radio and all kinds of podcasts forever, but he started this new one in 2022 called word of the day. And so a comedian comes on, we just, he gives us a word reason a sentence. It's, it's a fun little thing and it's done really well for him. He's had some big guests on like Jim Jeffries and, you know, of course myself, um, and it's on a network and definitely check it out if you have not checked out his show. Um, and I'll put links to that also in this show here, but episode five ten that week, I had Carly Pope on and I love Carly Pope. I loved Carly Pope since, uh, I first saw her in popular back in 2000. She's really funny and a good actress and super likable and in a bunch of stuff. So I was absolutely over the moon that she just said that she just said that she decided to be a guest on the show. Uh, we had a super fun conversation. Just, she was even better than I imagined she would be. And uh, that was a really fun one. Um, for me, uh, then I did a thing called the dangerous thing podcast um where i forget what i even talked about there it was a topic i'll have to go back and look because i forget but I'll, I'll go back and look but it's if you google me and a dangerous thing um i forget what i even discussed but anyway i was on that podcast that week as well uh then valentine's week on february 2022 appropriate for valentine's week because i had val tossi on the show this is why i'm a professional everybody um uh, val is boston comic um i had her on the show on sort of an abbreviated episode years ago um we recorded it in the green room at laugh boston when we were both uh on a show with dana gould um val was also a friend of dana gould she is from salisbury mass home of the beach pizza which if we've not had beach pizza, you should at some point in your life. Massachusetts has at a at minimum four different, very distinct styles of pizza that are unique to Massachusetts, uh, including bar pies, which are fantastic. Uh, the Cape Cod Cafe freezes them. And you can get them shipped to you. There's also a really good place that opened recently in Medford, Mass, called Four Pizza that does uh, kind of a spin on bar pies. They have a hot honey pizza. Oof, love that. Um, it, despite my efforts to lose weight, which I have been eating much, much better uh, generally. And I don't eat a lot of processed stuff and all that stuff anyway, but, um, Friday night I still, I get pizza and ice cream <laughs> and it's the one night a week. I have a soda. I have a Pepsi, uh, because without that, I, oh, I look forward to it so much. Like it's, it's, uh, it's kind of sad how much I look forward to Friday night pizza, but that's, you know, I'm watching all my stuff and do the, um, anyway. Um, so yeah, that, that is, uh, that is Val. I don't know how I started talking about, oh, cause, uh, beach pizza. But, uh, yeah, we actually sat down and did like a full length episode and she put in an album this year called beach trash. Speaking of beach pizza, and it's very, very good. Uh, you should get that album cause it's worth getting. Uh, I also did <clears throat> an, a ninth anniversary special with Josh Gondelman that week. Um, and Josh was, and that's a super fun episode because Josh has blown up, I guess is what the kids would say. He blowed up real good. Uh, Josh is someone who started comedy just slightly after me. Um, but then became wildly more successful than me. 
I think his first thing that he got notoriety with was he did like, I think called modern day Seinfeld on Twitter. Uh, we'll talk about Twitter later. Uh, and he got a book deal and then he started writing on shows. He wrote for John Oliver, which I, I forgot for some reason. I forgot until recently that I opened for John Oliver at the Wilbur theater, which was like a sold out huge theater show. I used to do that sort of thing. Uh, and I started when I started doing comedy in England in 2002 or three, um, there was an open mic at Goldsmiths college that this guy, Alex Zane used to run. And uh, John Oliver used to go when I would go, which was kind of funny. Um, he is now a, a name in the UK, but uh, was was not for years. He moved here and got famous. But anyway, Josh was a head writer on that show and Deuce and, Deuce and Morrow. <clears throat> I forget. I, I'm terrible with pronouncing names. Uh, and, and so he was the very first guest I had on the show. The first episode I released was with uh, Mike Kaplan, but the first one I recorded was with Josh Gondelman and... As I say, this is year 10, 2023 is year 10 of the show. I had the idea for the show in November 2013. And I think I recorded Josh. Yeah, it was January 2014. And so Josh was my very first guest. So it was, and he hadn't been on since. So it was kind of cool to uh, have him on uh, nine years later when he's doing very well and talk about, I think we talked about this week's television i think is what we talked about uh that was also the week that bob saget died which was really upsetting uh we had a lot of i mean every death <clears throat> we have every year is upsetting but this year was particularly bad um a lot of suicides uh which as someone who struggled with depression my whole life um doing okay -ish, um but had suicidal ideation since i was five years old and has made many attempts although not in many years um that that's a bum out. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, you can't help everybody, but they're, that's sad. But Saget wasn't a suicide. It was a, it was a really tragic accident and he was such a good dude. Um, I, I opened for him back in 2008. We did like a summer of like big outdoor shed shows, like the Hampton beach casino ballroom. And, um, you know, theaters in the round. One of them was, <laughs> was a revolving stage. I think it's the only time I've been on a revolving stage. Uh, one of them, it was in Hampton beach and, and a kid I went to high school with didn't know I did comedy and it was there just to see Saget. Um, and I came out and, and the kid almost passed out, which is kind of hilarious to me. Um, but yeah, that one hit hard cause I had stayed in touch with him and he was such a good dude and he would just, you know, email me every now and then and say hello. And, um, that was a shock, but, uh, you know, I'm glad I knew him and got to talk to him and all of his, his stuff is still out there and you can watch it. And I, you know, I have a bunch of great emails and memories of, of doing stuff with, with Bob and, um, yeah. So, you know, that's, that's the older I get, the more dead people I know. Um, but it could be worse, I guess, cause I could know, know people. <laughs> so I'm glad I have the experiences of, of having known the people and interacted with the people. And, and, you know, I try to look at it that way, especially in the last couple of years when we've all been <clears throat> really reminded how short life is. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll get back to that later. Um, but then the third, fourth week of February, I had another old punk rock friend on Rob Lind and Rob was in a band called blood for blood and a band called Ramallah, um, which I'll get back to later in the year. And, uh, is, is the older brother of my friend, Mark Lind, who is of the ducky boys fame, um, who I still haven't had on the show. Like Mark needs to be on the show at some point, but Rob is great. Uh, super smart fascinating guy. Uh, always love talking to Rob and have forever. So it was really, really great to catch up with him. That is a fun episode. If you, if you like Boston accents there, it's all over that one. Um, but Rob is also kind of a nerd <laughs> and really into D and D and, and fantasy shows. And so there's a, there's a fun discussion there. Um, and it, again, this, the, one of the things I love about doing the show among the many things I love is getting to reconnect with old friends. It's a good excuse to sit down and chat for a couple hours with someone I haven't talked to in a long time, or that maybe I just interact with tangentially on social media or something like that. So this was a perfect example of that. Um, I, I build it as part one and we still intend to do a part two. So at some point, I'll hopefully have Rob Lynn back on for a part two. Cause you know, if only cause I just want to catch up with Rob again. Um, but very funny guy and, and just, just a smart, fascinating guy who, who's very accomplished musically. Um, especially if you are a fan of hardcore, or really heavy music, he, he's, he's done things you like. I will, I will assure you of that. 
Then the first week of March, the first day of Women's History Month, uh, actually came out the last day of February, the 28th, uh, had Justin Hart on from the Telly Hell Television Hell podcast. Um, and he was put in touch with me from Yarnell Nichols, who um, we've had on the show before and has a great channel um, on YouTube, which I'll also link here and has been on the show. And Justin is a podcaster and radio guy and, and TV fan uh, in upstate New York. And that was a really fun one. I enjoyed talking to him. Uh, he had some interesting takes on some stuff and, and knew uh, about some some of the ins and outs and business stuff more than I did, for sure, uh, about a lot of stuff. I also was on the Let's Face the Facts podcast um, in uh, February. <clears throat> I think it came out the third week. Um, I think that was my first appearance in 2022. I, I've done that show... A ton. I think this year I've been on the show like seven times and I love those guys. Uh, Matthew and David, David's been on the show before they do a, a facts of life uh, sort of recap podcast. It's pretty much done now because they're on the last season. And that's why I've been on a bunch. Cause that's my favorite, uh, my, my favorite season of the show, um, favorite seasons of the show. But I think the first one I did was in February, 2022, the first one in 2022, I believe I guessed it twice in 2021. Um, but yeah, if you want to hear me on let's face the facts, that's a very fun show. I, I always look forward to doing that. So I did that one as well, uh, in February. So check that out too. Um, well, I did a lot of podcasts in February that weren't mine. Um, <clears throat> but you know, I, I, that's the thing. I, whenever people, <laughs> whenever people ask me to be on a podcast, I pretty much always say yes, because I appreciate it so much when people guest on my show, <laughs> um, and that anyone says yes to guesting on my show and that anyone has ever said yes to guesting on my show, because I mean, who am I that I really feel like, you know, I, I, I'm obligated to guest on other people's shows. Uh, not that, not that that's a bad thing and I do have fun doing them and I'm glad that I do them because if I didn't say yes, I wouldn't have had the great experiences I've had guesting on other people's shows. So, um, that's a little, little inside for you. If, uh, if you want to have me on your show, I'll very likely say yes and, and at least try to do it, um, schedule wise. Um, and it's even easier now with remote things. Uh, but we're on to March. So Justin Hart was first week in March, second week in March, episode 514 was Laura Lee Abbey. Um, she had a, a new podcast out that was very, very good. Um, I, I did not know her before, um, and, and really loved talking to her. She has a very interesting story involving, you know, reality TV and, and, uh, just really fun episode there. Um, again, it's, in addition to the people that I already know who I like to sit down and, and catch up with the people who I don't know at all, but we have that shared experience of television and getting to talk about things that we have in common and also learning their stories. And, and it, it's amazing to me that I've made it 42 plus years on this earth and been talking to people every week on this show specifically for 10 of those. And there are still, you know, fascinating stories and people's experiences, and I'm still not sick of hearing them. Um, and I realized that my show can be for some people can be kind of ang angst, angst ridden, um, make them anxious. Cause you know, you, you see a new guest every week, so you kind of know what you're going to get, but you also don't. Cause if it's especially if it's a guest you never heard of, you're like, how's this going to work? Is this going to be one that I like, is this person going to interact well with Ken? Um, as opposed to like the podcast where it's just, you know, the same two co-hosts every week and they interact and you know, you have, it's more like a, a fun family radio you know, morning radio gig. Um, so I, I do appreciate you guys coming on the journey with me on these things, but I think more often than not, they, they turn out really well. And, uh, as cliche and stupid as this will sound, I can't believe I'm going to say this. Uh, I often come out of the episode with a new friend and, uh, that was the case with Laura, uh, Laura Lee. I'd be very, very fun. Uh, then <clears throat> that weekend, oh, there's Larry. Uh, he's barking at nothing. Hold on one moment while I attend to his needs. Also that week in March, two things. I appeared on the Weird Albums podcast talking about UHF, which is my favorite Weird Al album. Um, that's another thing I watched this year. I watched Weird, that Weird Al uh, Hulu original. Was it Hulu or Roku? <clears throat> loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Uh, it's basically a parody of biopics and uh, is very in keeping with UHF. 
good cast, super fun. Uh, even if you don't like Weird Al, which I don't know what's wrong with you if you don't. Uh, <laughs> really fun show, uh, or movie rather, um, and I enjoyed watching that. But I talked about UHF on that episode, and that was a lot of fun because, you know, I, I always like talking about music. I don't, occasionally on the show, I'll talk about music if it comes up, but uh, music and records and albums, and uh, this, it, I sound like such an old lady. Music and record and albums and the music you like, you kids. Uh, but music is so important to me and has been my whole life, maybe even as much as television. And <clears throat> I, I love talking specifically about that. I love reading the 33 and a third books. I love, you know, just reading music reviews and, and finding new albums. And, you know, go, although I dumped Spotify, if you're listening to this on Spotify, you know, thank you. Um, but I'm not paying them any money anymore. Um, but I use title. Uh, so that's one thing I switched to uh, a T I D A L. I highly recommend title. I don't even actually know if they have podcasts on title, so I don't know if my show's on there, but musically, um, they're, I think they're based in Germany or Norway, but they seem to be a pretty ethical company. Streaming is a whole nightmare. You make garbage anyway. I think of all the streams and we're talking like a million streams, I think of this show, um, and another good amount of streams from my comedy albums. Um, I think I make <clears throat> maybe 30 bucks a year or something like that from streams. It's like tenths of a penny per hour. It's a really bad deal. Uh, and then Spotify, t aside from Rogan and all that other crap, they, um, they took off all the comedy albums for a while. Mine's still not on there again, because for musicians, you get a royalty for the performance and for writing the material. And for comics, you don't. So for spoken word stuff, you just get a performance royalty, which is less than half of the writing royalty as well. And they, and there was a lawsuit. So instead of actually paying us, uh, they just took off all the comedy albums, but Anyway, title is great and is in hi-fi and high definition sound. The sound is a billion times better than on Spotify. So if you, you know, listen on headphones or you have like a decent sound system in your house that you stream through, I highly recommend title. Uh, they also have some cool, more obscure stuff and some punk rock stuff and, and new wave and, um, goth and stuff like that from the seventies and eighties that I couldn't find on Spotify that's streaming on that. Um, and, it, and it's 10 bucks a month as well. So <clears throat> highly recommend title. But anyway, I love talking about records. And, and so I did talk about UHF on that weird albums podcast. And then that weekend I was back at Northeast comic-con. I think that was the last comic-con I did. Uh, and, and interviewing people. And that was interesting. Uh, you know, had a bunch of people on from that. There's a few episodes from, uh, that recording that I put out. I think, um, John Wesley ship again, uh, Tara Reed, um, uh, what's his name? Vernon Wells. There's some, some live chats. I know people don't tend to like the live ones. Um, but I always try whenever I do a live one, um, which is nice. Cause it still means I don't think I've gone a full year without doing a single in-person episode. So there are in-person episodes that I've still been doing, um, which is good because it's now that the genie's out of the bottle with remote ones, I think even if, and when the pandemic totally goes away. If it does, it's very difficult for me to justify why someone needs to meet in person. Other than that, I just want to meet them basically. Um, you know, if I'm in LA, cause I used to go to LA for all of March and all of October and I just pump episodes through, like I do two, three episodes a day. So I bank episodes. I have sort of, um, you know, I go through fits and starts. So like most of the episodes you're hearing now, I heard in the last month, I did a couple months ago <clears throat> because I do like October is a big month because <clears throat> I try to get in as many episodes as I can before people are busy with the holidays and new year stuff. Cause then otherwise it's like a real scramble. And it's really hard to get people to guest. And again, it's not really a topical show, so we can, they can sit in the can for a little bit. Um, I do always try to release them in the order. I record them at least, um, for continuity purposes, but they do sit in the can for a while. So yeah, I would go and I would, I would bank all these episodes, but if, and when I go back out to LA again, well, when, um, it, it'll be difficult to get people to meet in person when they can just do it remote. And, you know, especially with some of the celebrities and stuff where they're just like, why would I go talk to you? Um, so I don't know, we'll see how that goes, but it is nice to still have some in-person episodes every year and, and conventions are a good, uh, excuse to do that. 
<clears throat> although I'm wary of conventions again at the moment, but we'll see what I do in 2023. Um, again, no big conventions anymore. Um, Denver is Fan Expo. Fan Expo is Boston. They use YouTubers and stuff, and they don't. They're not interested in having me on them, which is fine. That's their. That's their thing. But anyway, <clears throat> I did do Northeast Comic Con, and there's some episodes out from that week. And my point being, whenever I do live episodes, I try to put them out as additional episodes. So you still get a sort of studio episode that week and a live episode. So everybody's happy, right? Everyone's happy. So that week after I went to Northeast Comic Con, I had Amy Shields on. And Amy is uh, an Irish actor. Um, again, this is an example. Of, I mean, she's in L.A., but this is an example of someone who, you know, internationally who I wouldn't necessarily have on otherwise. And people probably best know her from being in Twin Peaks, The Return. Um, and Angela Bell, Bell Menti died uh, this year, which was sad speaking in Twin Peaks. Um, but Twin Peaks, The Return, I've rewatched this year again and just like it even more every time I see it. Um, but Amy's super fun and smart and funny and charming and, and and very Irish. And uh, that's a fun episode. I enjoyed talking to her quite a bit. Then uh, we are on the third, the last week in March. <clears throat> this was a busy week. Um, I was on Alison Rosen's show again. Um, I always love being on Alison Rosen's show. I know a lot of people here um, are listening because you heard me on Alison Rosen's show. Um, that's always interesting to me too, how people hear about the show. And this year I did get emails from people who took, first heard about the show this year um, or first started listening this year. So it's kind of cool that nine, 10 years in, there are still new people coming onto the show. And every time I do like another podcast or a, like a press, a press hit, as we call it in the biz, um, you know, I'm always like, well, if I get one or two more people listen to the show, this is worth doing. Uh, and so, so it seems to work out. Um, <clears throat> so Allison show, a lot of people heard me on Danish show, obviously Douglas movies, risk and that sort of stuff. So that, that's a, that's a, a nice, uh, nice benefit, but yeah, I was on Allison show and, and always have a good time on that. Uh, even when I'm feeling very down, I think I was very depressed that month. <laughs> um, that might've been the month that I was, a, it was a real downer on our show, but, um, it's, it's always fun for me to do and keeps me sort of tethered to humanity. Um, which, which is probably a good thing. Um, so that week I was on Allison show and the episode I put out that week, episode 516 is Bridget Tyler, who is a writer. She wrote on burn notice. She writes, uh, novels. That was really fun chat. Uh, as you know, I'm a huge burn notice fan and had Matt Nix on the show previously and really, really, uh, love talking to her and, and just, just talking shop. That was a fun one. And then the next week, for the last week of March, I had Brian Salisbury on the show from the Junk Food Cinema Podcast, and Brian and Cargill had been on the show in a live one I did at Denver Comic Con, I don't know, five years ago, something like that. Uh, I also co-hosted, I filled in for Cargill that month uh, or the month before with Brian, so I guested on, I might have been a Patreon-only one, but I'll check and put a link in if it's not, of Junk Food Cinema Podcast. But uh, Brian was on the show. That was a really fun chat. Uh, if you if you enjoy that show and you listen to the show, we we chatted and that that's how this works. It's a chat. People chat. All right. <laughs> we chat. Get over it. And here we are in April, 2022. Oh, April we made it through the winter. Uh, well, the last winter wasn't too bad. Although I did take on Christmas day. I took, was it Christmas or new year's? I slipped on ice and I fell down a ton of concrete steps and I was in pain and bruised for weeks it was super not fun but uh and my wife reminds me every year that uh every year i'm like oh man this is terrible and she's like every year you slip and fall <laughs> and hurt yourself for like two months uh in the winter and so i don't know fingers we'll see what happens in 2023 thus far in december when i'm recording this i have not so hopefully but it hasn't been that icy uh but anyway it's not it's always nice to get out of winter in new england because winter is depressing and it is grim and even though i don't leave the house very much uh, it's still nice to know that i could <laughs> so that's why i avoid winter so we're into april Which brings us to April. Uh, April, I went a little bit crazy with the <laughs> guitar stuff in that I um, I was getting pretty much broken guitars and then I was refinishing them. So I would like strip them down and paint them and I got way into spray paint and taking things apart and putting them back together. And the reason it's kind of crazy is because um, I'm not very good at it. So, uh, but it was something to do. It was, it was sort of oddly satisfying to... Uh, 
you know, to sit down on a Sunday and get a screwdriver and take something apart for the day and then put it back together. I don't know. Um, but back to the show. Uh, my first guest of April 2022 was Dan Larson, and Dan has been a longtime YouTuber. He has a channel on there called Toy Galaxy, now Secret Galaxy. Which, if you're unfamiliar with, you should check out. If you like this show, you would absolutely love this show. What? <laughs> if you like this show, you'll love this show. If you like this show, you'll love his show. Uh, and Dan is actually a local guy. He's based out of Manchester, New Hampshire, but is uh, internationally famous. He is uh, far more successful than me at this sort of thing. And I love his show. He actually was requested by you, the listener, to be on a few times. So made sense, asked him, and we recorded it. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, I watch his show every week. So that was that was very cool. He's a cool dude. The next week, uh, the second week in April, I had Jeff May on the show, <clears throat> who shockingly I had not had on the show before. Jeff is also a local talent made good. He is based out of Los Angeles now. Uh, but Jeff is a stand-up comic. He's got a bunch of podcasts. Uh, also, but probably wildly more successful than me, at least on the Patreon side. Uh, he does this full time. <laughs> um, but a uh, comic book guy, uh, very similar interest. He's from Worcester. Uh, this one, we talked about Mary Ton of Cocaine, I believe, who was the founder of Table Talk Pies in Worcester, Mass, who, who died last year. And her name was Mary Ton of Cocaine. That was her actual name. Still amazes me. I that. Wow. Uh, then another old friend, but this time returning to the show was Marley helping Grazer. And Marley is amazing. I love Marley. I've known Marley for like 20 years. Uh, sadly, we did make tentative plans in this episode for me to visit uh, Los Angeles in October that I didn't, uh, as you probably know, and we'll get there. Um, <clears throat> so I could see the Warner Brothers lot the, the, where they shot the back lot, where they shot everything. They tore it down this year and I never got to go on the Warner's lot. And it kind of hit Marley and I at the same time, because Marley's been in charge of like all the Warner superhero DC animation stuff for like 10 years. And every time I'm in LA, I meet up with Marley a couple of times. We usually get Italian food and not once was he like, let's go look at the lot, which I can't fault him for because he was like, wow, I, I, I always thought you, you had more connections than I did. And you'd been there a bunch. And I never ask for anything, so I lost my opportunity. I'll never see the Warner backlot, the famous Warner backlot. It no longer exists. There's some um, <clears throat> interesting but sad footage on YouTube of, of them tearing it all down. And uh, it, it's very strange because... It, it looks good on film generally, but is sort of post-apocalyptic anyway, because they're not full houses. So you go and there's nothing in there or they're like, look de demolished from the back. So they already, if you're not shooting it from the right angles, it looks a little, it looks a little end times, uh, but actually tearing it down, it's even more so, but fascinating place. Um, you know, I, I lost my chance. I never got to go there. The only lot I've ever been on is Paramount, uh, thanks to my friend Trisha, and it, which was amazing. I loved going on the Paramount lot. Um, never been on Universal. Um, never been in Warner Brothers. I think I've been on some other lots, but they weren't like you know, the studio lots, like I've been in like small lots where they shot like sitcoms and stuff, which is still pretty cool, but it's not the uh, the lots. So. <clears throat> maybe someday, maybe I will get to, <clears throat> I get, my throat keeps getting so dry and I keep getting hoarse while talking on the show. So maybe I need to speak in a higher register. I don't know. My is my natural speaking voice too low and I'm uh, doing something wrong. I, I would always lose my voice when I was in a band. Uh, I don't know. Did you know I was in a band? Uh, when I was in a punk band, when I was a teenager, I would like constantly lose my voice. I always had a sore throat. I was always spitting up blood, but that was because I just screamed all the time. And I'm definitely not screaming here. So Lord knows what this is. I went to the doctor. There's nothing wrong. So, but I don't know if you're a vocal coach or something, you got any tips? I do the honey, do the, do the lemon. But uh, the more I talk, the, uh, the more I cough and the more hoarse I get. And it seems to be getting worse with age. Maybe that's just one of the things you hit your forties and your body starts to fall apart. Anyway, <laughs> that's Marley. I love that guy. You know, hopefully I will see him again someday. Uh, if I do travel to Los Angeles again, uh, a lot of people have asked too, like, how come I haven't been going back to Los Angeles? Cause I have traveled a little bit, um, in the last year, two years, I went to new Orleans in 2021 for work, which I hated. Um, I went to Las Vegas in 2022, which I'll get to when we get to June, but, uh, Los Angeles, it, it's, I had a trip scheduled for October. 
I had an Airbnb booked, the one I always book in Burbank, which is very nice. There's a pool and everything. Uh, and I had booked it for like a year in advance, but there's no, you know, no cancellation fee, which was nice. But <clears throat> one, a ton of my friends moved out of LA, like during the pandemic, they lost their jobs. They weren't in productions. They couldn't get gigs. So it was really expensive to live in LA. So they moved out of town. A ton of my favorite restaurants closed. Uh, I'm still not comfortable sitting in like a movie theater really with a bunch of people or going to a show. And so I'm not going to do that if I'm in LA. Um, and the flights, because the gas prices and stuff, uh, A, they stopped doing direct flights to Burbank, which was the best. I used to be able to get direct flights from Boston to Burbank for like $200 round trip, which is amazing. Uh, and now they don't do them anymore. So they only go to LAX, which sucks. And also they're like $900 minimum which is insane. So I just, this year has been really tight money wise and tough. So I, I just couldn't justify it. So I, I canceled the trip. So I don't know, maybe in a year or two, I'll get back out there and things will come down. Plus the drought and the fires. And it's just, ugh. I don't know. It wasn't, it, it wasn't in the cards this year, but, uh, I did do the show from home and the last episode of April, 2022, I had the great Caitlin McGurk on and Caitlin, I met via the found footage festival guys. And Caitlin is a uh, professor, Caitlin McGurk, um, at the Billy, the Billy, Island, the Billy Island, Ireland, uh, cartoon museum. I get it. I'm doing it off the top of my head, but she is the, the, the curator and the, the head honcho there. She actually used to work with Stephen Bissett, uh, at the, um, cartoon Institute up in Vermont that he center for cartoon studies. I think it's called. Um, and she's super funny and, and great and smart and everyone loves Caitlin. She's the best. Uh, and if you don't watch the found footage festival, she is on almost every week on their sort of sub show that they have on Saturdays, um, called, uh, Saturday morning cartoons. <clears throat> so she's a guest on that often because her specialty is cartoons. Uh, but that's a really fun one. I, I really am glad that I got to talk to Caitlin. Then we kicked off May. This is a big one for me. <laughs> this is a big one. We kicked off May with Rob Stone, the Rob Stone of Mr. Belvedere, Kevin of Mr. Belvedere. He's a director. Now, uh, we met via Twitter. So some good things happened or were still happening on Twitter. And at least the first half of 2022, what an awesome guy, uh, loved talking to him. Uh, also now I've had all three of the people who played children on Mr. Belvedere on my show. So that's pretty exciting for me. Um, and you know, I talk Belvedere all the time. Uh, we confirmed the rumor, the Mr. Be the infamous Mr. Belvedere rumor. If you know what it is, that's exciting for you. Uh, I won't tell you if you don't know, but uh, he, he confirmed it and just a great, I loved talking to, to Rob. That was a great episode. And also that week I was <laughs> quoted in the Boston globe. I was interviewed by the Boston globe about Dr. Strange and the multiverse of madness. And the only two people I believe that are quoted in the article are me and Sam Raimi, which is pretty exciting. Uh, I talked forever to Marth Goldstein about um, my thoughts on multiverse stuff and Dr. Strange and, you know, my, my old school comic book nerd uh, stuff went in full, full effect. So that was really fun. And then I also got uh, my booster uh, shot on that week. So uh, the thing is I, was, I had to go to Las Vegas in June. So I wanted to get a booster the month before. So I got my booster. Uh, and that was pretty fun. No, no ill effects. Uh, again, still haven't got COVID. And the next week I had a returning guest on the show. This is actually his second appearance, but his first solo appearance and his first studio appearance. It's Michael C. Morona, who you probably know as Big Pete from the Adventures of Big of, uh, of Big Pete and Big Pete, the Adventures of Pete and Pete. And uh, Mike's again, awesome dude. Uh, I, I worship that show. I love those guys. It's so strange to me that I'm friends with them. Uh, and it's always fun to talk to them for me because it's just bonkers uh that they're just like a guy that i know and that was really fun uh the next week i had greg stevens on and greg is the genius behind the knickknacks youtube channel and if you aren't watching knickknacks you should be and this is a channel where he's going through every single show that aired on nickelodeon not nick at night necessarily there's some crossover there um if it aired on nick but also nick anyway year by year from the inception of nickelodeon i think he's been doing it about four years now um and we talked about the issue we talked about was the week and the year that nickelodeon launched i think in 
1979. And uh, he's just a super good dude. Uh, very, 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 very well uh, read on the subject. Uh, does a ton of research. Uh, also funny and insightful. And and that was a really fun one. I, I as I that, that much like the Dan uh, Larson one. I've been watching. Greg's show for years and it was fun to sit down and talk to him. And I, uh, I used to tape trade for, for, I don't know, 15 years. So I had I don't know, maybe a thousand DVDRs I'd made of VHS tapes of rare and hard to find Nickelodeon shows that I had either taped myself or gotten on the trading circuit. And a lot of them are not online. Uh, that's one phenomenon. Put that aside for a moment. I'm going to talk about that in a sec, but um, a lot of them aren't on like archive.org or YouTube. So I basically just mailed them all to Greg. <laughs> I was like, you will get more out of these than I am currently. So I just don't have time to go through them. And it will be more fun for me to see them uh, see clips from these as part of your videos than they're just sitting in a box in my house. So that, that has been, uh, come to fruition and is great. Um, <clears throat> about hard to find media. So, uh, it, it's been sort of happening for a while, but in the last year, especially for whatever weird reason, YouTube no longer really cares about most stuff getting uploaded there. Worst case, they give you um, a copyright claim, which means you can't monetize that thing. I mean, I don't monetize my YouTube anyway, because I don't have enough uh, subscribers. I only have like 300 or something. I think you need a thousand, which incidentally, hey guys, <laughs> why don't you subscribe to my YouTube channel? You don't even have to watch it and it's free. Uh, but if I get to a thousand, I get like a 10th of a penny of you. Uh, for the couple hundred views I get on the videos, but the videos actually are really good. I, 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 if I do say so myself, I have a lot of fun doing them and they are very, uh, much, uh, uh um, an entertaining supplement to this show, the videos. So I, I, uh, I would encourage you to go on there and, and subscribe to my YouTube channel and then, you know, thumbs up everything and like everything. So my, the algorithm makes it go to people's, uh, in people's eyeballs. But anyway, uh, the monetization thing is the problem, but so YouTube just kind of allows everything now. And especially the weird, like if you're not playing pop music or doing like modern stuff or bootlegging, like movies and theaters, um, or showing violent, horrific acts or that kind of thing. If you're showing the sort of lost shows and the sort of seventies, eighties, nineties media that we talk about on the show all the time, uh, pilots that never got picked up, uh, rare shows, commercial blocks, they don't care. And they're all up there and it's pretty amazing. And then the things that aren't up there, like, um, Broadway video, Lauren Michaels is pretty litigious or at least on it for Saturday night live stuff. So that's not on there, but all that stuff is on archive.org and archive.org is amazing. Uh, shockingly, they don't have very many TV guide issues. I have tried to, this is something you could help me with. Um, I skip for the last three years. I've every issue of TV guide that we've talked about on the show. I personally sit and scan into the computer at 600 DPI, uh, page by page. It takes me a few hours depending on the size of the issue in the year. And then I save them as PDFs. So I have, I don't know, 200 issues of TV guide, uh, PDF. I tried to upload some to archive.org for, for you, the viewer and for people who wanted them, but it's like a kind of laborious pro process. Like it takes a while. You have to fill out all this stuff. I might be doing it wrong. I don't know if you know archive.org better than I do, if there's a way to sort of quickly upload stuff or bulk upload stuff. But if there is, let me know. You can email me, tvguidancecounselor.gmail.com, canadaicanread.com, or just send me a message on social media uh, because I'm more than happy to make those PDFs available. But anyway, archive.org org archive.org <laughs> archive.org uh, also is filled with rare media there's tons of video on there and every episode of SNL most of them from original broadcast or um, first cut syndication so uh, as you may or may not know I'm kind of a pre-millennium SNL nerd and uh, at least until I don't know the 2005 or so, uh, an SNL episode without commercials uncut should run 75 minutes, uh, or 65 minutes. I'm sorry, an hour and five minutes. And that's all the sketches and the two musical performances. If you go on Peacock right now and you go to watch old SNL episodes, especially stuff from the eighties, some of those episodes are 20 minutes, 
15 minutes, 40 minutes. They cut tons of stuff out of them. And it's not just the musical uh, performances, which would kind of make sense if there was like a rights issue or whatever, but sketches. And even in the ones that are, and I'm making air quotes here that you can't see complete, they replace sketches with rehearsal sketches. So that's the other thing you might not know about SNL. Every Saturday, they do two runs of the show. They do a dress rehearsal with a full audience that's exactly like it would be live. And then two hours later, they do the live SNL live episode. And between the dress rehearsal and the live one, they cut sketches and move sketches, but they film, you know, they tape the first, the rehearsal special. So sometimes in syndication, they've cut sketches that are either controversial or for whatever weird Lauren Michaels reason and replaced them with sketches that didn't air. They were part of the, the, uh, the rehearsal, the dress rehearsal, they also sweeten things. So they'll put laughs in where they aren't there, which always bothers me because, uh, at least growing up watching SNL live, there was a real, uh, excitement watching a sketch completely bomb. And usually those sketches were the, were the 1150 sketch, like uh, the 1250 sketch, the one, like the last sketch of the night where they would stick the, the weird sketch <clears throat> at least before people became really aware of that and kind of expected a weird sketch in that slot. And then I think some of those sketches tried a little bit too hard. Uh, I blame Bill Bradsky. Those started okay, but then got, they kind of were too aware. They became self-aware and it got kind of crappy, but those sketches were generally my favorite because they were so strange and they would just be done in complete silence from the audience, which is amazing. But in syndication and on the Peacock versions, if those sketches even are present, they'll, they'll put in canned laughter and it's just, it's just garbage, but they're still there at least. So you can still get them. So archive.org and YouTube, and there's probably like dark web things that I don't know about because I'm not super computer savvy. Uh, you can probably find everything, but in a really accessible way. And at least YouTube, I have on all my TVs in my house. So, I mean, I can watch pretty much anything uh, on there. And so my, my boxes of DVDRs of traded tapes, which I still have, um, have been rendered relatively useless. Although there is some stuff that's still not floating around uh, that I have that I've been kind of uploading uh, the fast times Richard and high TV series, you know, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so that's been another project of mine this year is sort of slowly. I mean, in general, like here's a shock to you. I have too much garbage in my house. Um, not actual garbage. It's not dead cats and stuff, but just a lot of stuff I've accumulated over the years because I have mental health problems and there's a thrill to have accumulating those, but it's overwhelming and, and there's just too much of it. So, uh, every week I spend a couple hours going through some stuff and getting rid of stuff. Um, the big things I've been doing is anything that I could get again, um, <clears throat> for, I think the rule out that we have is, is in 20 minutes for less than $20. I don't need, you know, if I, if I, if I really need that, I can get it again. So that, I mean, that's most like mass produced things. Um, or, um, if I can get it as a digital version, so either PDF of magazines and that's all my magazines, like Fangoria, Sassy, everything. Um, and, and frankly, actually, when I scan these TV guide magazines, I then usually recycle the physical magazine itself. Um, if you want them, let me know. But, uh, I used to give them out if I do live shows and stuff, but, um, not really doing that now. So, so I recycled them. So anything like that, uh, I don't keep, uh, any music that I can stream. I don't keep, uh, vinyl. The stuff that I'm keeping is like either stuff that I have like a real emotional attachment to, because I remember finding it in a record store. Or it was like sort of, sort of a seminal record for me or stuff that, you know, someone gave me personally or autographed or that kind of stuff I keep. Um, but you know, mass produced stuff, I'm generally not keeping movies, that kind of stuff, unless there's like really great extras on them. So yeah, I've been doing that through throughout the year, uh, you know, whittling down my vintage Halloween decorations, my vintage Christmas decorations. I think I got, I, think I had like, bit, uh, I think I had 12 big totes of, uh, Halloween decorations and got it down to seven. And I think Christmas I had 19 and I got it down to like 13. So, you know, I'll do that each and every year. But so as I'm doing that, um, you know, I'm appreciating stuff like archive.org and <clears throat> I'm going through these DVDRs and I'm, kind of inventorying everything I have. And this is thousands of DVD. I mean, I'm talking like, I don't know if 12,000 DVD There's like, there's, there's like 25,000 hours of television here. 
And, you know, as I'm doing other things, I kind of look and, and I'll do a quick look and see if this is available on archive or YouTube. And if it is, I kind of throw it in a pile and get rid of it. If it isn't, I put it in another pile and then I've slowly been uploading that stuff to clouds and to those sites. And if you're a Patreon, I actually um, exclusively uh, allowed you to watch the Fast Times Richmond High TV series, just 10 of us. Uh, I Married Dora, some of the more rare TV series. I, I've made like private playlists that you can watch uh, on the Patreon site. And if you're already a patron and you and you like that, um, I didn't get a ton of feedback a little bit, but if you like that sort of thing, um, let me know. And if you have requests for shows that you can't find, I can upload them there and we can watch them or maybe do a watch along something like that. I don't know. Let me know. But anyway, so I've been going through that stuff, which has been good because it's purging stuff, but also it's giving me a good sense of like what I have and reminding me of stuff. And that that's part of the reason it kind of triggered me to start doing more videos online, which I'll, I'll talk about when I get there later in the month. Uh, but anyway, that's Greg Stevens <laughs> long and short of it. Uh, the next week, <clears throat> this may be my favorite episode of the year or like the biggest deal episode of the year to me. Maybe, um, Dave Thomas. So if you know me, you know, I absolutely love SCTV. It is like my everything. <laughs> it's my sketch show. I mean, speaking of SNL, I, like SCTV is, is everything to me. I, I watch SCTV almost every day still. Um, there's a few shows that I watch every day, like while I'm going to bed or, um, you know, just throw it on in the background. It's like mystery science, the Earth 3000. And I'm including riff tracks and stuff with that, uh, or, or SCTV. Like those are the two. And, uh, Dave Thomas, had him on the show. Um, uh, and I, I want to thank Ian from the Ian talks to podcast for, um, kind of helping make that happen. Um, not kind of, he did help make that happen. And it was great. It was great. Dave was even better than I could have imagined. We had a great chat. We kind of discussed all the things that I wanted to ever talk about with him. I'm sure there's more, but you know, I, I didn't feel like I left a stone unturned. It's one of my favorite episodes of the year. It's not a format episode, but it is for me, at least just a great, great chat. And I, I got good feedback from people as well who seem to like it, but that, that, that's, that's a contender for episode of the year for me. Absolutely. If it, for some strange reason, you haven't heard the Dave Thomas episode, go back and listen. Cause that is really, really great. That's uh may, may 23rd. That one came out. Uh, also that week I left the house. I, uh, my dad got his knees replaced <laughs> and my dad moved to Maine a couple of years ago. And so, uh, he was not doing great. Um, so I, I drove up to Maine, uh, and, and visited him, um, got some, uh, Mexican food in Maine. I know, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so then we're into June, <clears throat> my birthday month, June. Uh, this is the month I was still 41 at this point, but by the end of the month, I turned 42. It's LGBTQT pride month. I think it's mental health month. There's like a bunch of months. June's for some reason is like 18 different months, uh, or, you know, earmarked as certain months. Um, but this, the first episode I did that month, episode 526 was with, again, another really old friend in comedy, John O'Zelay. And Jono started here in Boston. He's, he's been out in LA for years. He's from California originally. Uh, for some reason I used to call Jono board shorts. I don't know why I was kind of a dick in the, in my early days of comedy, <laughs> I would make nicknames for people. I also used to just, um, like write unsolicited sitcoms for, about people, um, that were funny, but also kind of just weird, um, I had a lot of free time on my hands before I started doing a podcast, <laughs> but John, had a second comedy album come out and it was a good chance to have John on the show. So that was a really good uh, chat. And there's, if, if you, especially if you like hearing about the old days of Boston comedy, or at least my old days of Boston comedy, uh, there was, quite, there was quite a lot of that this year. There was a lot of reconnecting with old friends. Uh, and John, the John episode is, is no exception to that. The next week, <clears throat> Drew McWeeny was on and Drew is again, someone who I've wanted to have on for a while. Um, got a ton of requests to have Drew on the show. Uh, we made it happen and that is a fun one. So if you missed that one, check out Drew McWeeny. Uh, the third week in June was Mary Kate Wiles, who I was unfamiliar with, but she was uh, promoting her, uh, 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 headless. I think it was, um, that her sketch group has been doing these really cool sort of short form movies. And uh, I loved it. I was pleasantly, pleasantly surprised at how, uh, nice, uh, our chat was, and she's great and funny and, uh, you know, felt like an old friend. That was, that was really cool. And then <clears throat> the, the third week, fourth week in June, <laughs> I went to Las Vegas. Oh boy. Uh, oh boy. Did I go to Las Vegas? Uh, I, uh, where do I start with Las Vegas? 
So I'd never been to Las Vegas. No shock there. There's sort of nothing for me, I think. And my day job, there was a conference in Las Vegas and they kind of encourage us to go to conferences every year. And I had just been boosted and it's a, it, you know, it's a medical conference. So I'm like, it'll be probably pretty safe. And I really, I really have been trying to force myself to leave the house and go to places as much as I can, because I do have a tendency to isolate, um, and feel anxious and super depressed. And, um, yeah, I have some problems. I still haven't found a therapist. Uh, but so I've been trying to force myself out of the house whenever possible. So I'm like, all right, I'll go. Um, you know, it's, it's a free trip essentially. I have to work, but it's free trip. Um, you know, I can get a nice suite at a hotel at least, um, and sit in a hot tub. So I hadn't flown in a while and man, have people become shittier than ever flying. Uh, masks were not required at this point anymore. Of course I wore one. Um, you know, the plane was just filled with dickheads. I mean, it is going to Las Vegas. There was a lot of bachelor parties and stuff. Um, when I got there, it was early in the morning. I think I landed at like nine in the morning. Um, I rented a car for the first couple of days because it was cheaper than getting like an Uber from the airport to the hotel. <laughs> um, even though I wasn't paying for it, but it was still cheaper. Um, so I did take like a, a, a courtesy van or courtesy bus, shuttle bus to the rental place. And so we're waiting in line. This kid behind me in line. And when I say kid, I mean the Boston version of kid. He was just vomiting like every 30 seconds, almost like clockwork. And he'd puke. Like I would say like a beer's worth of liquid every time. And then just turn around and, and just still wait in line to go pick up a car. I like, it was nothing. And then got in an argument with the, with the Hertz people. Cause they wouldn't let him go pick up a car. Cause he was actively vomiting and smelled like booze. So I'm like, all right, this is <clears throat> already off to a good start. So I go and I stay at treasure Island. <laughs> which I, I don't know anything about Vegas. I don't know. Maybe it's not one of the better hotels. You tell me if I'm ever going to go again, tell me where to go. Uh, I had to wait in line to check in, which I've never had to do. I've been staying in hotels and traveling for, <clears throat> I don't know, 30 years. I've never once had to wait in line to check into a hotel. Uh, and in this instance, I had to wait in line for like 45 minutes and it was a huge pain in the ass. So I go and I check in, it's a casino, everybody's smoking. It was just garbage. Um, you know, the conference was whatever it's work, but, Oh God, did I hate this place? Uh, it, it was just, we, we had no hot water one day. It was just like filthy. There's just like drunk people everywhere. It reeked like cigarettes. Uh, I went to go use the pool because I like swimming and <clears throat> normally hotel pools are like desolate. I'm usually the only one ever in there and I'm just do, 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 do going down there with my towel and, my, you know, and I go to the pool and this is like in the middle of the afternoon. It is packed like to the gills. Like you could not get in this pool without rubbing your body against at least three strangers. And they're all smoking and drinking in the pool. There's a DJ. It's like a rave uh, in the middle of the day on like a Wednesday. And I'm like, I, this is awful. I am not. <laughs> this is God awful. Uh, I, I just to avoid staying in my room so much. I, I did do slot machines a bit, um, which just really depressed me because I have obsessive problems and it's hard for me to stop doing a thing once I start doing it. Um, you know, lost a little bit of money. Um, although I, I did set aside a budget that was like, I'm not spending more than this. Um, but yeah, it just bummed me out like crazy. And everyone's like, the food is great. And it wasn't like, maybe there's buffets or something, which I'm not going to. <laughs> um, I went to buddy from cake bosses pizza place and got a takeout. And that was, that was decent. Uh, I went to the evil can evil evil pie, uh, pizza place. That was fine. I went to the old Vegas strip. One good thing was my good old buddy, uh, Andre Gower of the monster squad. Who's been on this show, um, was living in Vegas at the time now. And so we, I got to hang out with Andre. We went to the pinball museum. That was pretty cool. Uh, it was like 150 degrees every day there in June. And I'm in a suit with a mask on. So that is already a torture test. Um, it just was, it was not for me. It was not for me. It was just lonely and depressing and, and sad and kind of everything about America that makes me feel bad about myself and everything else. Um, yeah, but there was a few okay moments in there. Uh, I, I did, I go into the atomic testing museum. And so I am 
obsessed with Atomica stuff, mid-century, the atom bomb, all that kind of, uh, you know, I'm a comic book fan. What do you want? So I'm like, oh, I'll go to the Atomic Testing Museum. That'll be interesting. And so I go, and when you first get there, <clears throat> it's, you know, they have the sort of kitschy stuff. Like they had a Miss Atomic 1954 dress that looked like a mushroom cloud and, you know, various, you know, kind of kitschy stuff that they used to sell in the mid-century. But then you go in to this recreation of the concrete bunkers that they watched the A-bomb tests from and these big metal doors close behind you. And there's a little window with a screen behind it, but it, it sort of replicates what you would have seen if you were watching the actual test. And then they do the countdown and it's the actual audio from the A-bomb tests. And they show the, vid the, the video, it's a film piece of the A-bomb test. And then the room shakes and like dust is kicking up everywhere. And it was... It sounds stupid just for just explaining this to you now, but it was traumatic's not quite the word like impactful. Like it kind of messed me up. I was like, Jesus, this is whoa. And then there was like a 10 minute little propaganda documentary after it, which was super pro A bomb, which I should have assumed. Like I didn't think this would be an anti atomic weapon museum. Uh, but it was about like all the people that got radiation poisoning and whose, you know, lives are destroyed because of these tests. They basically had people going like, Hey, you know, that's too bad, but it was, uh, you know, we needed it, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So I kind of walked out of there in a stupor and just re extra bummed out. Uh, then they have the mannequins that they, if you've ever seen footage of the atomic test, there's like half melted mannequins that they would have in these houses to see what it would do to people. They had some of those mannequins there and fallout shelter and fat boy. And it was like, I kind of wandered back to my hotel feeling even more badly detached from reality than I already was. Uh, so yeah, I, I couldn't wait to get out of Las Vegas. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I am not eager to go back there again. Um, it was nice to travel somewhere that I hadn't been before. So that was good. Um, just like same with New Orleans the year before. Um, if you have a recommendation of a place I should go, uh, I am trying to at least travel once a year, every year these days, if I can, if I can afford it. Uh, but Vegas, uh, I'm crossing that off my list. And I've been to Reno before, which, um, I guess is like the more low rent Vegas. And I didn't, I didn't care for Reno very much either. And no, no, no offense to the people who live and work there. Like, you know, that's, that's your, that's your thing. And there are people who like it and that's fine, but it was not for me. So then I had my birthday I turned 42. That was also the week that, uh, Roe versus Wade was overturned. It was just, it was a bum out of a week. It was one of the worst Junes I've had, uh, in, in recent memory. It was, it was not a fun one. Um, but we did have fun episodes and the last two episodes of that month were at least great. Uh, episode 529, I had Damon Blake on and Damon is an Irish comedian. He's on the tri channel and he is hilarious. I always love seeing him pop up on there for some reason in my brain. He reminds me so much of John Hodgman, who's a buddy. And obviously I love John. And so Damon, I'm instantly like, I like this guy. He's very funny. This was a cool episode. I, I love the episodes where I get to talk to people who aren't American. It's always fascinating to kind of hear their view of things and what they got. And, and it was just so fun. And then we ended the month with another one of my favorite episodes, Anne Marie Johnson, who is just awesome. Like she's the best, just a fascinating person. Um, done so many amazing things. Again, another person I met via Twitter, um, which I'm so grateful for. And, and, she's so down to earth though. And just like, cool, it's done so many cool things. And that, that episode was great. I've, I've been watching her and stuff for so long and always loved when she popped up on screen. And I absolutely loved that episode. That was really, really great. And then that brings us into July. Oh, before I get to July, uh, I did in fact, uh, see a cool show in Vegas. So here's a cool thing. Um, I saw Shin Lim who, if you've watched, um, America's Got Talent or Penn Teller Fool Us. He is an amazing, amazing card magician. Maybe better than Ricky J, um, which is saying quite a lot. I, uh, I'm a huge Ricky J fan. I think Ricky J is unbelievable. And Shin, <clears throat> just, uh, just amazing. Um, the stuff he does is so good. And he's a local, local talent made good. He's a, a Boston guy or a Massachusetts guy, rather. And cool story. Awesome dude. Uh, his show was great. The audience was garbage, just complete trash garbage for the most part. Uh, but I, I think that <laughs> that's par for the course in Vegas, um, from what I've been told. So I did see that. So there, there is one good thing. <clears throat> then we go to July. 
uh, where are we? I, Emery Johnson ended June with, and then in July, um, I recorded an episode with Brittany Luce and Eric Eddings of the, uh, for colored nerds podcast who were awesome. Like I could have talked to them for weeks. Uh, we actually had to reschedule this a couple times. We had some technical issues twice. Um, but it, what a cool conversation. If you're not listening to their podcast, please do. It is fantastic. Um, I love those guys and I, I, maybe I'll have them on again if they'll do it i really enjoyed it and they're uh as i said super cool then uh the third week in july i didn't do anything on july 4th i never really do does anyone do anything um i don't really i didn't like social gatherings before the pandemic like i never have fun at parties or like big crowds a bunch of people never have never have since i was a kid um i would even as a little kid if we went to like a party uh for my parents friends uh i would find like a bedroom <laughs> or like a basement uh in a stranger's house and just watch tv uh by myself or i'd bring and or bring books and a sketch pad and just draw stuff and read comics that's kind of what i did and even in high school i kind of did the same thing minus the sketch pad and the comics which is why I was not super popular, uh, especially with the ladies anyway. Um, so I I didn't do anything. I I don't know if you guys did, uh, but the next week I had Baratunde Thurston on and Baratunde is an old, old friend. I've known Baratunde since I started doing stand up. So 20 years, 20 plus years. Uh, it is amazing to see how well he's doing, but not surprising. He's super smart and just a good dude. He has a show or had a show this year. I don't know if it's gotten a second season yet, but hopefully it does, uh, on PBS where he would travel around America. Cool travel show, smart, fun, um, fairly light, uh, in comparison (laughs) to the way things are these days. Um, but I love Baratunde and that, that was a good episode. And if you want to hear old friends catch up. That is, that is a good episode for you. Um, anyone, if anyone wants to start a condiment company called old friends catch up, uh, I think you'll do very well with it and, uh, you can just have it. All I, all I ask in return is a million dollars, just $1 million, a mere million dollars. That's it. I think that's fair. The next week, this one was a long time coming. Uh, I had director, writer, martial artist, coolest woman in the world, Lexi Alexander on. And again, two people in the last 30 days as of July, um, are people that I met via Twitter. Um, Lexi is a fan of my Twitter account and, uh, we became friendly and, and chat back and forth. And we have a lot of the same interests, believe it or not, between martial arts and, uh, eighties nostalgia and, and music and all that kind of stuff. So became friends. Um, and we were supposed to do this in person a couple times when I was in LA, we had it scheduled for March, 2020, uh, then I came home early cause there was a pandemic. So we finally made it happen. And then she was doing a movie, which was supposed to be for Netflix and then has been dropped. So hopefully she'll get distribution for it next year. Cause it seems to be a pretty cool movie. Um, I can't wait to see it. But what a cool conversation. I loved talking to Lexi. I love Lexi. She's the best. Um, and which I'll get to later in the, in the year, uh, Lexi really kind of pushed me in, in the best way. I, I joke that she bullied me <laughs> into doing more video content, like especially on TikTok, which I realize is an evil Chinese, um, plot to destroy the world, but the world's doing a pretty good job. Uh, on its own without help. So, uh, why not? Um, so I started doing all these sort of TV guidance counselor shorts, which I don't know if you have checked those out. I don't know what percentage of listeners. So I think there's roughly 10,000 of you follow me on social media or on YouTube. I only have 300 subscribers on YouTube. So certainly it's a small amount. I don't even know if those people who subscribe, listen to this show, uh, or if the people who follow me on any other social media, uh, listen to the show. But if you don't, uh, at a minimum, go, go check out my YouTube channel. Um, I have links in the show description and, uh, on all of my things I have a link tree. Just let me know. Um, but I've been doing these short videos that are anywhere from a minute to nine minutes and they're, uh, I don't want to say deep dive because they're short, but uh, a deeper dive into a lot of the obscure shows that we talk about on this show, a lot of the specific things we talk about on this show, like, for example, the Richard Belzer getting uh, almost murdered by Hulk Hogan. I, sh- I talk about it. I show you the footage, some follow up stuff, put it in context. Um, it's almost like the TV guidance counselor investigates a uh, little sort of short pilot uh, audio episodes I did, which people liked. They were just a lot of work, so I didn't um, I didn't continue them. But this is sort of taken up the mantle of those because you want to see the visual. It's a, it's a visual medium. So this is a nice supplement to the audio version of the show. And some of them I do exclusive to the Patreon. The Patreon always gets them early. So I've done a ton this year. I think I've done 
like six hours of video content this year. The other thing I've been doing is I will get like a week's worth of promos for a specific network, HBO, ABC, NBC from either, uh, you know, some, some either 35 years ago, 30, 25, you know, something that's like nominal, like 10 years ago. And then I'll do like a reaction to each night of what's on that week and kind of show you the promos. It's fun. Um, so <clears throat> trying to do a bunch of different things, seeing what works, seeing what takes off with people. Um, nothing quite yet, but I've been having a lot of fun doing them. And, and I'll talk about those more as we go further through the year. Uh, because like I said, they're a lot of fun. I also did a cool interview. This was sort of off the record and anonymous, uh, and you'll never hear it, but there is a student at BU who's doing their master's thesis on comedy and like inclusiveness and, and, and sort of a case study of Boston comedy. So, um, she talked to me for like three hours <laughs> that week in July. And as you know, I can talk Boston comedy all day long. And I certainly did. That was really cool. Um, I don't know. I doubt, again, I doubt that will be public. Um, but it was cool to do. I like talking about that stuff. Um, then the next week I had someone I didn't know, but um, was promoting uh, a bunch of stuff. So, you know, asked to be on the show and I had a good time talking to him. And it's Gian Marco Cerezi. Um, and he was a fun guy, funny guy. He's doing very well. I, I recommend you check him out. This was also the first episode I recorded with. Um, I switched from Zoom to Riverside FM, which is a podcast specific format uh, or or model. Um, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. Um, app. I'm not being sponsored by them in any way. Um, and frankly, I've had sort of semi mixed results with them. So there's been some, um, technical issues that I've managed to sort out, but it, it's when it works, it's amazing. And it works eight out of 10 times. Um, but uh, I won't get into the details of what it does, but, uh, that is one of the reasons why I have very good video of every single episode I've done. But again, I, I don't know what to do with them or, um, if people want to see shorts of anything like that, but that was the first one I did there. Uh, and then that was the last one of July, the first episode of August. And this really was kind of like a, um, this year I didn't interview a lot of, uh, old Boston punk rock friends. And that week was no exception. It was Mike Kane of Michael Kane and the morning, morning afters. I forget what he's, what he calls his band. <laughs> like, wow. Um, I should probably look stuff up before I talk. Um, but, uh, what a good dude. Uh, he has a great band and we talked, you know, TV, Boston comedy, all that kind of stuff. It was really fun. Um, and that's a fun one to check out again, a lot of Boston comedy chat in that one. And a really fun thing I did on August 4th was as part of Kino cult, which is Kino Lorber who puts out a ton of Blu-rays, um, with great extras. They have a Kino cult sub label and a YouTube channel and the YouTube channel puts out for free, uh, full movies, like movies that used to be really hard to find. And so they asked me along with, uh, my friend, Heather Buckley, who was on our Halloween episode later in the year. Um, and a few other people to sort of live tweet their, uh, they dropped, uh, dropped, they dropped, um, beware the blob, which is the 70s sequel to the blob. And it's wonderfully awful. Uh, so we all live tweeted that and that was a ton of fun. Uh, I, I would love to do that again. If anyone wants, well, I don't know about Twitter, but, uh, if there's another format or maybe we can do like a watch along on the Patreon or something like that, uh, if there's a cult movie you want to do or anything like that, that, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed doing that. Uh, then the next week was a uh, listener and writer, Otto Bruno, who writes about cult movies and is a fantastic guy, um, has a book out that you should absolutely get. If you don't have it, definitely get it. Uh, I had a great time talking to Otto. That was episode 536, the second week in August. And that week I recorded two episodes of the cinephile hissy fit podcast this is a really cool podcast uh these guys are listeners of the show um longtime followers on social media um and they have a cool podcast where you talk about uh a movie and kind of defend it and um it's a fun format and i did two movies uh neither of which they had seen i did repo man which is <clears throat> probably my all-time favorite movie and uh, back to the beach they loved Repo Man. They were completely unfamiliar with it, had never watched Alex Cox movies, um, and ended up loving it. So that was very, it's very gratifying for me because anytime I can turn someone on to Alex Cox, I am, that sounds weird. When I can turn you on to Cox, uh, when he turns someone on to Alex Cox's, uh, cinema output, I, I am 
over the moon. Uh, they hated for the most part, back to the beach, which I understand. I love back to the beach. It's a silly movie. It's a fun movie. And it came out on Blu-ray this year, which is pretty amazing. Uh, there's a fantastic Blu-ray release and I, I pick it up. It's cheap. It's a fun movie. It's a fun summer movie. If you just want fun stuff to watch during the summer, back to the beach is one I always watch summer school with my commons. When I always summer school with my common, uh, which would also be a nice tribute to Kirstie Alley, uh, who's great in that movie as well. Um, rest in peace, Kirstie Alley. Uh, uh, One Crazy Summer, which we all know my attachment to One Crazy Summer. Uh, usually, um, Revenge of the Nerds 2, Nerds in Paradise, slightly less problematic than the first one. Although I, I guess if there's a guilty pleasure movie, I don't like the term guilty pleasure because um, I rarely feel guilty about things that I watch. I mostly, I mostly just feel guilty all the time anyway, because I have uh, a cultural Catholic guilt, even though I'm an atheist, but I did grow up in this area. Uh, but Revenge of the Nerds are probably the closest thing that qualifies for that. Uh, and Summer Rental. Uh, Carl Reiner did two summer movies in a row. Summer Rental and Summer School. <laughs> and I love both of them. Summer Rental's a cute, fun movie. John Larroquette. It's... Yeah. Anyway, so uh, Back to the Beach, I put in that um, rotation. We used to do, we haven't done it in a few years, but we used to do outdoor movies in the summer at my house. We'd, we'd have people over um, after I just said I don't like social gatherings <laughs> um, and get eaten alive by mosquitoes. And, and I have a projector and, you know, we'd do like a whole uh, kind of drive-in thing outside. And that was a lot of fun. So, so, so Back to the Beach is a movie that you should really get. I, I highly recommend it. I don't know if you can hear that in the background, by the way, but... Uh, I mean, it's winter now officially and someone in my neighborhood, I swear to God, every day is blowing leaves and, uh, whose leaves, uh, is blowing leaves and has a chainsaw going uh, all day. I'm like, what, how, like, there's no, so if you can hear that in the background, I apologize. You may not be able to hear it. Um, and, and there might be people in my home are like, what noise? It's just in my own head. But, but Anyway, regardless, <laughs> we're in August, which was summer, uh, when leaf blowing didn't happen, uh, but lawn mowing did. Anyway, speaking of lawn mowing and outside, I'm a professional. I <clears throat> did a live show on August 13th. I did a live show at the Vanuland Festival. Vanuland is a really cool uh, local online magazine, you would call it, about music and comedy and all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's national, but, it, you know, they, they focus on local stuff. And uh, they did a festival at uh the medfield i think it was medfield medfield state mental hospital a former medfield state mental hospital which is a really cool huge complex that you've seen in movies it was in shutter island uh and was xavier's school in the new mutants which is a movie i liked i know people hated that movie and i think it could have been much better in fact i rewrote uh the script to make it better <laughs> because that's what i do um but uh it, it's that exact area so it was an outdoor festival i hadn't done stand-up in a while I think since December of 2021, uh, when I was, uh, up in Vermont and New York with Todd Berry, but, uh, it was fun. It was, a, it was a fun show. It was nice to see some people. It was outdoors, uh, union square donuts, which is fantastic brought donuts. So I got to eat some free donuts, walk around Xavier school. Very cool. And then Sunday, the 14th, I did my second stand up show of the year. Uh, I did uh, stand up for pits, uh, which is a, a fundraiser I've done every year for the last, <clears throat> I don't know, five, six years uh, for pitball rescue. And I always enjoyed doing that. Um, and that was just a good, good time. Both shows went well. Um, I, I was masked for the indoor one the next day, but it was fine. Uh, and then that week I had Natasha Sislo on it. I didn't know Natasha, but she put out a book this year. Um, called all signs point to yes, I think it's called, but it's a memoir about her trying to find love in France, uh, based on some advice she got from a psychic and Natasha's awesome. Uh, she is a writer. Uh, this was, I actually had the honor of being the very first podcast she ever did. And she's done a ton since then as she should, cause she is uh, funny and charming and smart. And uh, that's a really fun episode. And I, I really loved her book. So, uh, if you haven't gotten her book, check that out. It is very fun. Uh, and, on the next week. So second to last week in August, I had Aaron Manahan on. Aaron is the man behind the Soda Jerk, uh, a soda review website 
really funny guy, really fascinating guy. I, I pretty much totally cut soda out in 2022. I had pretty much mostly cut it out before then. I had like, I have one soda a week on Friday night when I have my pizza, but post kidney stone for 2022, I have been trying to, uh, eat better and lose weight. And I have been eating much, much better. It's like, you know, granola and yogurt and fruit. Uh, but I didn't eat a ton of processed stuff anyway, believe it or not. Um, but really cut out the baked goods. That was a big one. Oh God, I love baked goods and it's been tough. It, although I did just say I ate a donut from Union Square Donuts, <laughs> but I think I ate like donuts or baked goods, maybe like five times this year, which is a shame, but you know, that's better than no times or being dead or having a kidney stone, which was really brutal. Uh, but anyway, Aaron does this, uh, soda jerk, uh, soda review website. And I love soda and craft sodas and weird sodas. And Aaron's really funny and does it in a really interesting way. And it was great to have him on the show. Really, really enjoyed talking to him. And then that week I also did on the 27th, uh, my third show of the year I was with Todd Berry down in Connecticut, down on the New York border, uh, at this cool little, uh, resort. I forget the name of the town now. Um, but we got to stay in this cool little like motel resort thing with a pool that they gave me a very tiny towel. If you follow me on TikTok, you can see that very tiny towel. Um, I had a really fun show. Uh, I, I like doing stand up. I, I would do more of it, um, but I don't necessarily pursue it, I guess. The funny thing is, and this will make me sound like such a huge jerk, but I never asked to be booked anywhere. I've, I've never had a manager. I've never had a booking agent. And so I would just get requests and then I would do shows. And pre COVID, I was, I, I probably mentioned this on a past one of these year end roundups. I was super spoiled in that I probably did one show a week. It was either headliner or opening for like a big um, act at a big theater and, you know, didn't have to slog and I never did open mics and all that stuff. So I kind of haven't changed my approach. I've turned a few things down, um, just cause I wasn't comfortable doing indoor stuff, but, um, yeah. And, and it's easy for me. <laughs> like, I, I hate to say that, but people are like, you got to keep that muscle and you got to practice. But you know, I go, I'll go six months, 10 months without doing stand up and be able to go on stage and it's fine. Like I do really well. And it's easy mostly because I do this every week. I mean, I'm talking to people every week and hopefully being funny. I, I think you hopefully would agree if you're, if you've listened, especially this far into this particular self-indulgent episode, you probably find me amusing in some capacity and I'm used to talking. So, you know, it's easy for me. Uh, but, uh, mostly been doing totally new stuff and not really, um, thinking about it too much, like kind of just going up and seeing what happens and it goes well. So I don't know. Uh, we'll see where stuff, lands in 2023 i'll probably do more stand-up if stuff gets much better maybe i'll try to do an album again as kind of a big investment of cost that goes into that that historically i've always gotten back through streaming and people buying the record even if it took a little bit of time i don't know if i'd make the money back now so uh and as i said money's a little tight this year so i am uh I don't know. We'll see. Maybe let me know if that's of interest to you but anyway had a really fun show down in new york uh and um got to swim in a pool and have feel like I had a little bit of a summer, <clears throat> which was nice. Uh, the next week in the last week of August, I had Benari Poulton on and Benari, uh, speaking of old home week, this year was really like a lot of comics I've known for 20 years, a lot of uh, Boston, uh, punk rock people that I've known for decades and decades, getting to sit down and talk to them. And Benari again is someone who, uh, I knew from Boston for years and he has moved on to be a writer for a ton of great stuff and is really good dude. And it was great to stand and talk to him. That was a, a great way to close out August. And then we go on to September. It's back to school, everybody. September. I always get anxious, <laughs> even though I haven't been in school in 25 years. I don't know what that's about. Um, other people probably have this, but it's like a, uh, an annual version of Sunday night. <clears throat> it happens. Uh, that month I did the next to the lamp podcast, which I was unfamiliar with, uh, but it is up on YouTube. If you want to watch it, um, kind of interesting. I chat for like an hour. Uh, and then the first episode I did of September was with Rachel green. I was supposed to have Rachel and her podcast partner on in the same episode, but her podcast partner, Kirsten had to, had a family emergency. So we just had Rachel solo and Kirsten later when we'll get to it, but Rachel was super fun, super funny. New York comic, uh, went to college up here in Boston. We had a good chat. I enjoyed that one. And then I also had, uh, Jeremy licked on and Jeremy is someone I've wanted to talk to for years. He's in the twilight zone movie. He was on Valor. Uh, and Hogan family. 
<clears throat> and uh, just a nice guy. He d- doesn't do com- doesn't do comedy. He doesn't do acting really much anymore. Hasn't. He's back into it now. Had a nice chat about a lot of things I wanted to talk about. And I want to thank Steve Joyner, who's uh, Jeremy's manager, who um, hooked that up. And Steve actually uh, hooked up a bunch of episodes this year for me once i did that one with jeremy he was like oh jeremy's had a really good time i have these other people that i know who who would want to talk to you and um put me in touch with a bunch of people so uh thank you to him he's a good dude uh and uh i would recommend working with him the next week this was the third week of september uh this might be at least in my top five favorite episodes of the year uh i i really had a good time with this episode so this episode is uh oh you know what i totally confused otto bruno last month i'm i apologize to otto otto bruno let's go back to august 10th he wrote the barney miller book not that rod lott wrote the the cult movies book uh my brain everybody anyway otto bruno wrote an amazing book on barney miller go buy that book i'll get to rod lott later in september but apologize otto uh again didn't make any notes literally just looking at my calendar uh anyway third week in september Easily my top five episodes of the year. Joel Zwick and Joel directed everything, uh, full how tons of stuff. Joel also is incredibly candid, fascinating stories. I just kind of winded him up and let him go for, the, for an hour, and it felt like you know ten minutes. It was just amazing, awesome guy. Uh, do not miss that episode if you like old sort of Hollywood and TV stories, or not even that old. <laughs> then listen to that one. Uh, that is up there along with Dave Thomas and and a few others that are probably my top five. What were your favorite episodes this year? Let me know. Uh, email me, whatever. I'm always curious to see what people like and don't like. My my sense of what a great episode is or who's like an amazing guest is always different from, from the people listening. Um, my my uh, my barometer is, is attuned slightly differently. So it's always interesting to hear um, what people really loved. And speaking of things people really loved, the next week was an episode people absolutely loved, and it was with RJ City. And I didn't know RJ before this. Uh, Allison Rosen actually introduced us and was like, you have to have him on the show. And he's such a fascinating guy. Uh, this was a great episode. Talking about 50s TV, RJ's super cool. I really love talking to rj if you again if you hadn't heard that episode go out and listen to it it's very good uh and then to close out september <clears throat> this was rob lot <laughs> who wrote the cult movies book uh i i'm sorry again otto um rot rot auto and rot yes that's my new sequel to repo man uh rod lot or will not call rot <laughs> All of that is kind of, if he was a front man in like a late seventies, early eighties punk band, like rot would be like a pretty awesome name for front man. Anyway, uh, Rod Lott, super fun. Talk about cult movies. Great book. Pick it up. Uh, and the next day I appeared on, uh, NPR's radio Boston, uh, which is a local NPR station. They had me on with Bethany Van Delft, who've had on the show and is a good, good buddy. And it was great to catch up with Bethany. Um, they've had me on a few times. Uh, I was actually on last week for a year and roundup. Um, really fun. And it's cool that the local media, <laughs> the media, the bit mainstream media, um, has sort of recognized me and asked me to participate in these kind of things. Uh, I forget when it was, but it was before September, but earlier in the year, I was also on WGBH, which is our other NPR station. Yes, we have two here in Boston because it is Boston. We are a, a tote bag community. Again, apologize for the cat. She's fine. It sounds really pained, but she's totally fine. <laughs> she's just yelling. She's just looking at me and purring. Uh, I don't know. I, I guess when I get old, if that, if I do that, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so it was on uh, WGBH also earlier, uh, where I was talking about um, Harvard Square and how it's changing and that kind of stuff, and that was very cool. The first week in October, and October, as you know, is my favorite month uh, of any year. I had Amy Miller on, and Amy, super funny comic. We had to reschedule this a bunch of times, but I'm glad we finally got to do it. Uh, that week, I also recorded a second episode of Let's Face the Facts, which is one of my favorite podcasts to appear on. Uh, definitely check that one out as well. And then the second week in October, I had uh, Kirsten O'Brien on, who is Rachel Green's podcast partner, uh, who couldn't do it before, so we did two separate episodes. 
episodes. Uh, very fun. She's a Boston person. Uh, I've had some fun back and forth. Enjoyed talking to Kirsten. Uh, then we had Tim Harrod on episode 547. Tim Harrod. Tim was a writer for The Onion. Uh, he does a podcast called The Bastard Tapes. I was put in touch with him by the Found Footage Festival guys uh, who uh, loved him. Tim provides a ton of stuff for them, including uh, Cludes videos, which if you don't know what that is, uh, ask me and I'll send you some links. <laughs> They're very funny. Uh, but Tim's a good do- guy. Uh, the funniest thing was after I had him on, um, my neighbor, Mike Dennison, who you might know for his B. Arthur artwork, um, was like, oh, that's my cousin. <laughs> it's like, how very strange. Uh, but that was cool. Uh, and then I had Frank DeCaro on episode 548 for the second to last uh, episode of October. And Frank is someone who I've absolutely loved his his writing and his work since he was on The Daily Show back in the 90s and who is someone I've wanted to have on and who you guys, the listeners, have requested that I have on for a long time. And I finally did, and we had a great conversation. It was uh, just as good as I assumed it would be. And that weekend, on the 23rd of October, I did another live show. I did with Kevin Marr. I did Kevin Geeks Out About Character Actors at the Brattle Theater. Uh, I also, impromptu, did some, because I hadn't been to Harvard Square in years, and I used to always go there. I did some impromptu TikToks and various videos of kind of wandering around, seeing what was still open, what was closed. It felt very post-apocalyptic in Harvard Square. And that weirdly uh, went viral. It was I got like hundreds of thousands of views on this thing. Um, and a lot of angry, but both positive and angry feedback, which I guess happens whenever anything goes viral. Um, and that was really cool. I had some time before the show, <clears throat> wandered around Harvard Square and just kind of did impromptu filming, which some, why some of my facts are gone, are, are wrong. Uh, but that was a really fun show. I, it, it's sort of like TED Talks about pop culture stuff. And I did mine about the character actors, Mike the Dog and Jake the Dog, which I then did a video on my YouTube, uh, which I'll promote again if you want to check that out. Uh, and that was the week I had Frank DeCaro on. And that was also the week of the Halloween special, episode 549. Uh, this was a, a, a new approach. I, I had Stephen Bissett, Heather Buckley, Sam First, and Dana Gould on. I interviewed them all separately and then edited it together. Um, and again, I appreciate all the feedback I got from you guys who were very, very complimentary of the editing job. It was, it was a nightmare to edit. Uh, and I was just like, oh, I did this to myself. This, I caused this pain myself, but I got it done. Um, and it came out really well. And, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll do that next year for Halloween. I'll have a different group of guests, you know, it's, it's a year off, but, um, if you have requests for things you'd like me to do for the Halloween episode in 2023, let me know. But that was a fun one. I really enjoyed that one. And then the first episode in November, we had Paul Gannon on, and Paul is a British comic uh, who I've known for years. I've been on his podcast, The Cheap Show Podcast, and we did an, a, an issue of Look In Magazine, which was a British magazine, is the Junior TV Times. And this was really fun. Uh, it was kind of a on-brand but slight switch to the format. Uh, and again, I've known Paul for years, so we got along really well, and this was a fun episode, a little bit different. I got some good feedback on that one. People enjoyed that. Then, second week of November, I had Steve Lawrence on, who is the director of the Found Footage Festival. <clears throat> Here's a confession. <laughs> uh, I, Steve was one of the first episodes I did with uh, Riverside FM, and I had been using my good mic in my phone to film videos. And then when I plugged it back into my computer, it didn't recognize it. So my side of the conversation or recorded, it was almost unlistenable, like super muffled and bad. And I didn't want to lose the episode. (laughs) So like a maniac, I went through and transcribed everything I said in the episode. And then I went through and revoiced, like looping, (laughs) revoiced my entire side of that conversation with Steve. And uh, a few people noticed that the conversation felt a little bit stilted, but didn't suspect that I had gone and re-recorded my entire (laughs) side of the conversation. But uh, that... Yeah, I don't know if I'd do that again, but it was kind of a... It was also just kind of like... I didn't want to lose the episode, but I was also just kind of like, can I actually do that? (laughs) And I, and I did it. It, you know, it came across relatively good. Uh, then the week after that, November 16th, uh, or November 14th, rather, I had Eliza Skinner on again. And I love Eliza. She's one of my favorite people. She's so funny and smart and just awesome. And I've wanted to talk to her again forever. And so this was a really fun one. And, uh, then on Thanksgiving week, I had Larry Hankin on, who's a character actor. That was another one that Steve Joyner, um, hooked up for me. Larry's been an everything fascinating guy. I got to hear about Patrick McGowan, 
which I'm always uh, into. And Thanksgiving Day, I maybe for the last time live tweeted the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, which is always my favorite thing. Um, inad- inadvertently is not right, but um, unintentionally offended Gloria Estefan, <laughs> who replied to me very nicely. Um, they there was it looked like she was not bothering to lip sync, um, which I pointed out. And she said, no, they had the camera on me. I didn't tag her or anything. Um, she said they had the camera on me while my daughter was singing and we have similar voices. So it looked like I wasn't singing. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Gloria Stefan. I apologize. Hey, if you ever want to do the show, you have an open invitation. Gloria Stefan's cool. Uh, <laughs> I really like her. Um, also that week, this is a personal thing. I had to take Ted, uh, my standard poodle, Ted, who I love, I have three dogs, uh, for blood tests. So he is having surgery <clears throat> this weekend. Or by the time you hear this, it will have already happened. So December 26th, he is having surgery. Um, he has a like a growth between his eyes. He should be fine. Um, but obviously I'm very nervous. If anything ever happens to my guys, I get like super upset uh anything happens to dogs i get super upset yesterday i was actually in an antique mall in lawrence mass uh, canal street highly recommend you go there and it's in a big old mill and it's on several floors and the stairs are super precarious <laughs> like they're almost like uh like um those iron stairs that kind of you know the uh <coughs> what's the, i can't think i can't believe i think of, i can't think of the word a spiral staircase almost but so like the the inside edge is really steep and they're also really high up and they're made out of like concrete and steel like if you fell down these stairs you would be dead and while we were looking around the antique mall this woman had like a little sort of chihuahua bijan dog and a buggy very cute and when we were walking back down the stairs rachel had something bump into her and it was this little dog. He had like slid down a couple of the stairs and, and she stopped his fall. And then I grabbed him. Um, like if he had fallen down those stairs, he totally 100% would have died. He was an old dog he was clearly blind. He was a little sweet guy. And so I, I grabbed him and then she went and found the person. The woman was talking to someone and the dog snuck out of her, of her buggy and almost fell down the stairs. And I am like still traumatized about it to this day. I'm like, wow, if we had been like a minute later, a minute earlier, um, we wouldn't have, help that little because he was definitely going down those stairs so the woman was very upset um yeah if anything had happened to that guy i would have been very very upset but he was a cute little guy and he's he's fine now so that's good uh anyway where are we uh so ted got blood work because he has to get in a month before his um surgery and he's having surgery this week so by the time you hear this he should be out and fine and in a cone and i'm cuddling him uh right now the last week in november i had dave ross on and dave is another person who i've known forever uh want to have on forever finally had him on this is a really fun episode dave's a great comic uh and first week in December. So this month, Friday the 2nd, I did my second uh, Kevin Geeks Out episode. This was at the Brattle Theater again. I showed The Adventures of Candy Claws, which is the worst <laughs> the worst Christmas special of all time. Uh, I also did a video of that on my TikTok and all that kind of stuff. So um, if you would like to see that, uh, again, follow me on that YouTube. So hit that subscribe button, mash that like button. Um, it actually does help if you, if you like those episodes and in, in the little videos and you want to support it, it helps with the algorithm and all that kind of stuff. Um, and if you guys, honestly, I, you don't have to do anything. Um, why? I don't even know why I have to say that. Obviously you don't have to do anything, but if you, um, would like to, uh, help at all and you, you don't have extra cash to do the patreon or whatever if you have a couple minutes write a review of the show and like whatever you watch it on or listen to it on or subscribe to the youtube or subscribe to it on places even if you never listen to it or watch it there uh it actually is helpful and you know if you can't do it that's cool too but uh if you want to support the show that is very fun uh oh also in november i forgot to mention i appeared on w uh bur again our npr station and we were talking about um satire <clears throat> and I inadvertently stole one of Bethany's points and I still feel bad about it, um, about, uh, a modest proposal. So, but you can listen to that online if you want to, it was very fun. Uh, and I apologize to Bethany. Uh, then this month, December, uh, I had Alison Pregler on and Alison is amazing. She's super cool. We had a super fun conversation about dicks. Uh, it wasn't just about dicks, uh, but she does a, a, a YouTube series about rewatching Baywatch and Baywatch nights. So she's somebody people have been asking me to have on for a long time. And I'm glad that we managed to make it happen. 
via Twitter. Uh, thank you again. Um, and Allison's great. Uh, oh, I do want to mention after the Brattle show, where did Candy Claus? We did a show at the Somerville Theater, like an afternoon show of Christmas specials. And I got heckled by a six year old girl who there was a technical issue and I was kind of stalling and doing basically some stand up. And she just goes, uh, why are you doing this? And honestly, I didn't have a good answer. Uh, that was that was one of the most brutal, <laughs> one of the most brutal heckles I've ever gotten. But I'm okay now. Uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, Allison's great. Um, and, and now that we're kind of at the end of the year, let's talk about Twitter a little bit. <clears throat> I love Twitter. Um, it, it, it's it's not an exaggeration to say that it's been like a massive, it's had a massive positive impact on my life. I'm on there way too much, or was on there way too much, but it is how I've met like a ton of people who have either become really good friends or are people that I've really, really admired for years and years up to and including like Bonnie hunt. Um, it's how I've gotten a ton of people on the show. And so seeing Elon Musk, who's just human garbage, uh, just driving into the ground <laughs> and let, like neo Nazis. It's been sad. Uh, like it's, it's clearly not going to bounce back. And I know a lot of people don't follow me on there or don't participate on it, which I envy you. Um, <clears throat> but it, you know, it's sad to see it go. I'll see what ends up finally, um, replacing it. <clears throat> Something will, it won't quite be the same cause it'll be much more, specialized, um, and won't have the sort of saturation that Twitter has, but if it's Mastodon or Hive or uh, post or, you know, all those, I'm on all those things. So if you have one of those, you like follow me on there. Um, again, I have a link tree with links to all that stuff. So, you know, but again, if you're one of those people who does not partake in social media, uh, I envy you. <laughs> um, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, I don't know. So then, uh, two weeks ago we had steve rubin on and steve is again fascinating guy this is another one that i got hooked up with from steve joiner um he wrote the twilight zone encyclopedia a book about james bond that was a really fun episode i also recorded my third and final for 2022 episode of let's face the facts uh facts of life podcast that will be out next week or this week actually when you're hearing this um <clears throat> always love those guys again i think i did three appearances in 2022 i did four previous appearances so i've been on seven times uh if you like this show you will love those chats um david who is the the man behind the show has been on this show as well hopefully his co-host matthew will do it at some point too um and i'll be on in 2023 i'll be on at least one more time hop maybe two more times. So, um, we'll see, but that's something to look forward to, uh, last week, uh, final episode of the year before this episode, I had Mark Scheffler on, who's a fascinating guy. Mark was in last house on the left and then started writing like, uh, Charles and charge and Harry and the Hendersons and a bunch of TV shows, really fun conversation. Um, fascinating guy. The second person I talked to this year who was living in, who, who was, in Colombia while I was recording with them, which brings me to 2023. So 2023 is year 10 of the show. Um, by February, 2024, when we hit that 10 year mark and we're into year 11, I think I'll be on episode 650 or something like that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I'll do like 60 episodes in 2023 and another hours and hours <laughs> of, um, a video, but I'm going to keep doing it. So videos, like I did 31 videos in 31 days, uh, for October, I did a half hour Thanksgiving special of videos. I've done way less in December just cause I'm burnt out. Um, and I haven't felt the, the muse of inspiration, but you know, I'll, I'll probably do more in 2023. If you like them, let me know. Um, so we'll see what happens in 2023, but a few episodes that I have upcoming, uh, for the next month. Um, I have Lou Schneider is the very first episode of January, very first episode of 2023. It's a writer comedian. I loved that episode. It was super fun. Uh, the same week, it's going to be a two episode week. John D. Hancock was on. He directed Prancer and Wolfen and Bang the Drum Slowly. That's another one that Steve Joyner hooked me up with. Uh, then Tom Shabilla. Uh, who wrote an amazing book about TV circa 1967, the 1966 season. Um, also should be appearing on VCR Party Live that week, uh, second week in January, showing some uh, local Somerville 90s cable access clips. So that'll be really fun. I always love being on that show. Uh, the third week in January, I have Tiny, who's a, a Boston comic who I met uh, at that outdoor show for Vanyland over at the um, the 
Medfield State Mental Hospital. Uh, then I have Troy Devald on, who, again, is another Steve Joyner hookup. He is a reality show uh, writer, producer, wrote a book about reality TV. My first episode in February is a huge one. I'm so excited for this one. Rockney S. O'Bannon, uh, who is currently working on Evil, which is easily my favorite currently airing show. Uh, Ater- uh, Extraordinary Attorney Wu is up there too, but Evil's currently making episodes. I don't know if we'll get a second season of Wu. Um, <clears throat> he created Farscape. He's written for so many shows, but he also wrote, and we talked about it, both of these specifically in the Eliza Skinner episode earlier in the year. And for some reason, Eliza's last name, I cannot say without a Boston accent, Eliza Skinner, but I'm always like Skinner. I don't know why just her. Sorry, Eliza. But he also wrote my two favorite episodes of the new Twilight Zone, the Shadow Men and, and um, Wordplay, which are actually two of my favorite episodes of the Twilight Zone generally um, and is an awesome dude. Fascinating story. Um, that episode's going to be great. Uh, that is the first episode in February. Uh, Margot Donahue is on after that. I wrote a great book about uh, Brooklyn and movie shot in Brooklyn. Uh, Sarah Farazan, who's awesome. Such a cool person, local person, author, written some cool books. Um, my best friend that I've never hung out with in person. Uh, she, she's hitting us. She's joining us in February. India Pearl, who's another great comic. Uh, Smith the Ferris, who's She's uh, an actor. She's in Supernatural and a bunch of stuff. Uh, who else do I have looking forward in 2023? Connor McGrath, who's another really funny comic. Uh, Ashley Ray, who's the other person I recorded with in Columbia, who does um, the uh, TV podcast that's really good. And Rob Hill, who is an English writer who uh, has a YouTube channel called Bad Movie Bible, but has written several books about B movies. He's really smart and funny. And I always love the ones again with people from different countries because they have a different viewpoint. And Rob is really great. So that's a little preview of some of the episodes for 2023. Um, I also have some scheduled with some big names I don't want to tell you about because they might fall through and then I'll look like a liar. <laughs> but hopefully those will, those will work out. Um, but I'm very excited about those. Some people who I've been trying to get on for a long time um, and they wanted to do it, but it's just been a scheduling thing. So we will make that happen. Um, and as always, if you have people you would like me to try to get on the show, email me at Ken and I can read or TV guidance counselor at gmail.com. I always try to get them on. Um, I will do my best. Thank you again so much for, for being here. Um, I, I am amazed and humbled that people listen to this show and especially that you listened to this episode. <laughs> um, but again, people seem to like them. So this is my, my year end thing. And I, you know, it's, it's also good for me to go back and look at accomplishments and kind of, um, ground myself because time is super weird now and uh, you know it still feels like 2020 in a lot of ways so it is it is a a good exercise to go back through my calendar and look through what what happened this year good or bad uh again i will say 2022 was significantly better than 2021 um and obviously much better than 2020 and 2019 frankly um so i'm hoping that trend continues for 2023 for you as well i hope you guys are okay um i know people have had some tough times and and you know, and, and I always appreciate you guys reaching out. I'm more than happy to talk to you via sounding board, or whatever, whatever you need. I'm here. Um, and that is it. So we'll see you in 2023. Thank you guys again. Happy holidays. Happy new year. And we'll see you next time for a brand new year and a brand new edition of TV Guidance Counselor. Does anyone actually listen here? I always put a tag after this and I don't know if anyone ever listens to it but let me know if you do.